the Tanzanian coat of arms is decorating Victoria Station in London. For this week, Britain and her royal family welcome a most important state visitor, a politician who is widely respected the world over. President Julius Nyerere of Tanzania. Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip are there to greet him, as well as Prince Charles, Princess Anne, and other members of the family. It's a right royal welcome for this most unpretentious and modest of heads of state. Hi, welcome to another episode of African Biographics. In today's episode, we cover one of Africa's best known and most revered post-colonial figures, Mwalimu Julius Nyerere. Nyerere was the first Prime Minister of independent Tanganyika, who later became the first President of the new state of Tanzania after the merging of Tanganyika and the island of Zanzibar. Julius Nyerere is also known as one of the main thinkers and creators of the Organization of African Unity, the OAU, together with Kwame Nkrumah, and both of them were the major force behind the formation of this organization, which is now the African Union. In this video, we look at the life story of one of Africa's most formidable forces, Mwalimu Julius Nyerere. Nyerere was the son of a chief of the small Zanaki ethnic group and he was educated at Tabora Secondary School and Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda. In 1949, he would become the first Tanzanian to study at a British university when he went to Edinburgh on a government scholarship. It was there that he developed his own political ideas of grafting socialism onto African communal existence. He would graduate with a Master's of Arts in History and Economics in 1952 and returned to Tanganyika to teach. By the time Nyerere entered politics, the old League of Nations mandate that Britain had exercised in Tanganyika had been converted into a United Nations trusteeship with independence being the ultimate goal. Seeking to hasten the process of emancipation of Tanganyika, Nyerere would join the Tanganyika African Association, quickly becoming its president in 1953. In 1954, he converted the organization into a politically orientated Tanganyika African National Union, TANU. Recognizing his growing stature, Tanganyika's British governor, Sir Edward Twining, appointed Nyerere to be a temporary vacancy on the colony's legislative council in 1954. The following year, TANU sent Nyerere to New York to address the United Nations Trusteeship Council. When he was granted a hearing, he asked the United Nations to set a date for Tanganyikan independence and recognize the principle that the colony's future government be led by Africans. Though the British government rejected his demands, the debate established Nyerere as his country's preeminent nationalist spokesperson. He resigned from his teaching post to devote himself fully to campaigning for independence. For the next several years, he tirelessly toured the countryside, preaching anti-colonialism without racial strife, while building TANU into a powerful political organization, the membership of which grew from 100,000 in 1955 to half a million people in 1957. All this hard work paid off in 1958 when TANU candidates won all the seats available to them on the Legislative Council in the colony's first pre-elections. In the unrestricted elections of 1960, Tanu candidates won 70 of the total 71 seats and Nyerere became the chief minister. The understanding and mutual trust that would develop between Nyerere and the new British governor to Tanganyika, Sir Richard Turnbull, during independence negotiations helped make the bloodless transition period one of the most peaceful of any African nation. But it was not until 1961, when Nyerere was sworn in as a Prime Minister of the newly independent Tanganyika, that he would be in a position to start putting his ideas into practice. In April of 1964, Tanganyika and Zanzibar merged to form a new country, the United Republic of Tanzania, with Nyerere as its president. Julius Nyerere was a man on a mission for his country to grow nationally and internationally. This would start with him reforming the education sector with a policy he called education for self-reliance. As an educator and head of state, Julius Nyerere questioned the rationale behind the education system that was inherited from colonialism. He felt that the education system after Tanzania gained its political independence did not sufficiently meet the needs and social objectives of Tanzanians. Nyerere would go on to formulate the first policy on education, education for self-reliance. Education for self-reliance emerged as an attempt to revolutionize the education system, making it more relevant to Tanzanians, while using education as a vehicle for eliminating social economic inequalities in Tanzania and cultivating a culture of self-reliance. 
he was particularly concerned about how education discouraged the integration of peoples into society as a whole and promoted attitudes of inequality, intellectual arrogance, and individualism among those who entered the schooling system. According to Nyerere, education was supposed to serve the common good and foster the social goals of living together and working together. Education was supposed to help in the development of a society in which all members shared its resources fairly equally. Education was supposed to prepare the young people for the work that they will be called upon to do in the society which exists in Tanzania, a rural society where improvement would depend largely upon the efforts of the people in agriculture and in village development. So as a result of this, Nyerere would propose the following changes. The primary school entry age would be raised from 5 or 6 years to 7 years so that the student is older, more responsible and more mature on leaving school. Primary education would be restructured in such a way that it became a complete education in itself rather than simply a preparation for secondary education. Similarly, secondary education would not simply be a preparation for higher education. Another interesting change was de-emphasizing the importance of formal examinations which according to Nyerere merely assess a person's ability to learn facts. However, Nyerere's policy of education for self-reliance was not fully implemented in the totality of its philosophic concepts as well as in its practice. A number of contradictions would arise in the process of translating theory into practice. With that being said though, this policy would see the country of Tanzania make major strides in education. Primary education became essentially universal and Tanzania's adult literacy rate would also be among the highest in Africa. As president, Nyerere had to steer a difficult course. By the late 1960s, Tanzania was one of the world's poorest countries. Like many others, it was suffering from a severe foreign debt burden, a decrease in foreign aid and a fall in the price of commodities. Nyerere would argue that urbanization, which had been brought about by European colonialism, had disrupted the traditional pre-colonial rural African society. So, instead of following Western countries' strategies and Western ideologies only, he created an African National Socialist plan called Ujamaa. Ujamaa means family links or brotherhood in Swahili. Through Ujamaa, Nyerere believed that it was possible for his government to recreate pre-colonial traditions in Tanzania and in turn re-establish a traditional level of mutual respect and return the people to settled moral ways of life. The main way to do that, he said, was to move the people out of the urban cities like the capital Dar es Salaam and into newly created villages that were dotting the rural countryside. So Nyerere set out his policy in the Arusha Declaration of February 1967. Here's an extract of part of the Arusha Declaration by Julius Nyerere. He says, The objective of socialism in the United Republic of Tanzania is to build a society in which all members have equal rights and equal opportunities, in which all can live in peace with their neighbors without suffering or imposing injustice, being exploited or exploiting, and in which all have a gradual increasing basic level of material welfare before any individual lives in luxury. This process that was suggested by Nyerere started slowly and was voluntary at first, but by the end of the 1960s, there were only 800 or so collective settlements. In the late 1970s, Nyerere's reign became more oppressive as it began to force people to leave the cities and move to the collective villages. By the end of the 1970s, there were over 2,500 of these villages, but things weren't going well in them. Nearly 10 million peasants were moved and a substantial majority were forced to give up their land. But to most Tanzanians, the idea of collective farming was abhorrent. Nyerere's socialist outlook required Tanzania's leaders to reject capitalism and all its trimmings, showing restraint over salaries and other perks. But as the policy was rejected by a significant fraction of the population, the main foundation of Ujamaa failed. Productivity was supposed to be increased through collectivization, but instead it fell to less than 50% of what had been achieved in independent farms. Towards the end of Nyerere's rule, Tanzania had become one of Africa's poorest countries and dependent on international aid. Ujamaa was brought to an end in 1985 when Nyerere stepped down from the presidency. As I mentioned in the introduction to this episode, Julius Nyerere is also known as one of the main thinkers and creators of the Organization of African Unity, together with Kwame Nkrumah. At the same time, his government support was crucial for the progress of socialist liberation movements across Southern Africa. 
Nyerere is one of the people who joined other African leaders in denouncing the racist policies of South Africa and declaring that if the apartheid regime remained in the Commonwealth, Tanzania would never join. South Africa subsequently withdrew its membership from the Commonwealth. For Nyerere, the move marked the beginning of an effective commitment to African liberation movements. Later, he played host to the African National Congress and the Pan-Africanist Congress of South Africa. He also hosted Samora Machel's Frelimo, who were battling against the Portuguese in Mozambique, and to Robert Mugabe's Zanla forces, which opposed colonial rule in the then southern Rhodesia. Nyerere would go on to break relations with Britain, Tanzania's principal aid donor, after its failure to denounce the then Rhodesian Prime Minister Ian Smith when he declared the unilateral declaration of independence in 1965. Condemning white racism, oppression and misrule while ignoring similar actions by black rulers was not within Nyerere's conscience. In 1972, Nyerere denounced Amin when the brutal dictator announced the expulsion of all Asians from Uganda. It was left to Tanzania to intervene militarily and dislodge Amin. A brief invasion of Tanzania by Idi Amin in late 1978 brought a swift response from Nyerere. Tanzanian troops joined by Ugandan exiles were mobilized to drive back the invaders, but they simply didn't stop at the border. The capital city of Uganda, Kampala, would fall in 1979 with its residents lining the streets chanting the name of Tanzanian leader Julius Nyerere. Nyerere's intervention helped to unseat Idi Amin and brought about the return to power in Uganda of Milton Obote in 1980. However, this campaign proved to be very expensive for Tanzania while their leader devoted such resources, time and energy to foreign affairs. His critics in Tanzania would argue that he overlooked domestic problems. Though enthusiastically adopted by his countrymen and steadfastly supported by sympathetic Western European nations, Nyerere's socialist policies failed to spur economic development in Tanzania. At the time of his resignation in 1985, Tanzania was still one of the world's poorest countries with a per capita income of about 250 US dollars. Agriculture remained at a subsistence level and the country's industrial and transportation infrastructure were chronically underdeveloped. One third of Tanzania's national budget was supplied by foreign aid. However, Tanzania had one of the highest literacy rates in Africa, and the society was politically stable and notably free of economic inequalities. Nyerere himself remained committed to socialist policies even after he stepped down. When he stepped down, he declared that, Although socialism has failed in Tanzania, I will remain a socialist because I believe socialism is the best policies for poor countries like Tanzania. Since capitalism is completely ruthless, who is going to help the poor? And, and the majority of the people in our countries are poor. His successors decided otherwise, embracing capitalism and the free market, but with arguable benefits to the country. After his resignation, Nyerere continued as chairman of his political party until 1990. Thereafter, he assumed the role of the elder statesman and was regularly called upon to act as an arbiter in international crises as those in Rwanda and Burundi. Mwalimu Julius Nyerere died from leukemia on the 14th of October 1999 and was buried in his hometown, Putiama, in Tanzania. Julius Nyerere is undeniably one of the greatest and most respected statesmen Africa will ever have. He was a relentless pan-Africanist. Despite his failings, Nyerere was revered by progressive Africans. When they talked of Tanzania, they talked in effect of Nyerere, the simple, unassuming former school teacher who was untainted by corruption nor personal scandals. Let me know in the comment section below what you think about Julius Nyerere's socialist policies and his legacy. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't be shy to press that like button. Also, if you're new here and are interested in getting more of this type of content, then subscribe and click the notifications bell so that you don't miss out on any new uploads. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been Tatenda for African Biographics. Until next time, cheers. Have a good one.